And Quiet Flows the Dawn by Mikhail Sholokhov continued. I? Are you in your senses? Why should I be disturbed? I was only taken aback by the unexpected news. A couple of days later, the sergeant major came with a worried look on his face into Lisnitsky's dugout, and with much humming and hawing, informed him, This morning, Your Excellency, the Cossacks found these papers in the trenches. It's a bit awkward, and I thought it best to report to you. What papers? Lisnitsky asked, rising from his bed. The sergeant major handed him some crumpled, typewritten leaflets. Lisnitsky read, Proletariat of all countries unite. Comrade soldiers, two years this accursed war has lasted. Two years you have rotted in the trenches defending other men's interests. Two years the blood of the workers and peasants of all nations has been poured out. Hundreds of thousands of killed and wounded, hundreds of thousands of widows and orphans. These are the results of this slaughter. What are you fighting for? Whose interests are you defending? The Tsarist government has sent millions of soldiers into the firing line in order to seize new lands and to oppress the peoples of those lands as it already oppresses enslaved Poland and other nationalities. The world industrialists are dividing the markets by armed force and you, in the struggle for their interests, are going to death and are killing men toiling like yourselves. Enough of shedding your brother's blood. Awake, toilers. Your enemy is not the Austrian and German soldiers, but your own Tsar, your own industrialist and landowner. Turn your rifles against them. Fraternize with the German and Austrian soldiers. Across the wire entanglements which separate you as though you were animals, stretch out your hands to one another. You are brothers in labor. The bloody calluses of your toil are still on your hands. Down with the aristocracy. Down with the imperialist war. Hurrah for the unity of the toilers of all the world. Lisnitsky read the leaflet with rising anger. Now it's begun, he thought, gripped by a senseless hatred and overwhelmed with his presentiments. He at once communicated the discovery by telephone to the regimental commander. What are your instructions in the matter, Your Excellency? he asked. Take the sergeant major and the troop officers and carry out a search at once. Search everybody, not excluding the officers. I'll ask the divisional staff today when they propose to relieve the regiment. I'll hurry them up. If you find anything in the course of the search, inform me at once. I think it's the work of the machine gunners, Eugene said. You do? I'll order the commander at once to search his Cossacks. Assembling the troop officers in his dugout, Lisnitsky informed them of the regimental commander's order. How monstrous, Mirkolov exclaimed indignantly. Are we going to search one another? Your turn first, Lisnitsky, a young subaltern remarked. No, we'll throw dice for it. Joking aside, gentlemen, Lisnitsky interrupted, our old man's gone too far, of course. The officers in our regiment are as pure as Caesar's wife. There was only Cornet Bunchuk, and he's deserted. But we must search the Cossacks. Someone fetch the sergeant major. The sergeant major, an elderly Cossack with three bars to his cross of St. George, entered. He coughed and glanced uneasily from one to another of the officers. Who are the suspicious characters in the company? Who do you think would have left these leaflets about, Eugene demanded. There's no one in our company, Your Excellency, the man replied confidently. But the leaflets were found in our sector. Have any men from another company been in our trenches? No, sir. We'll go and search every man, Myrkolov waved his hand and turned towards the door. The search began. The Cossacks' faces expressed every shade of feeling. Some frowned in amazement. Others looked at the officers in alarm. Yet others laughed as the officers rummaged in their miserable belongings. The search yielded almost no results. Only one Cossack had a crumpled copy of the manifesto in his greatcoat pocket. Have you read this? Mirkolov demanded. I picked it up for a smoke, the Cossack smiled without raising his downcast eyes. What are you grinning at? Lisnitsky shouted furiously, turning livid and striding towards the man. His eyelids blinked nervously beneath his pince-nez. The Cossack's face turned crimson, and the smile vanished as though swept away by the wind. Excuse me, Your Excellency, I can hardly read. I picked it up because I haven't any paper for cigarettes, and I saw this lying about, and I picked it up. The man spoke in a loud, aggrieved, almost angry tone. Lisnitsky spat and turned away, the other officers trailing after him.
The next day, the regiment was withdrawn and stationed some seven miles behind the front line. Two of the machine gun detachment were arrested and court-martialed. Some of the others were transferred to reserve regiments, and some distributed over the regiments of the 2nd Cossack Division. After some days' rest, the regiment was brought into comparatively good order. The Cossacks washed and cleaned themselves up thoroughly and even shaved. Nor did they have to resort to the method used in the trenches, which consisted of setting light to the hair on the face, and as soon as the flame began to burn the cheek, a wet towel was passed over it, and the burnt hair wiped off. This method had come to be called singeing the pig, after a troop barber had asked one of his clients, Shall I singe you like a pig, or how? The regiment rested, and the Cossacks seemed outwardly light-hearted and in splendid fettle, but Lisnitsky and the other officers knew that the mood was only superficial and fleeting, like a fine day in November. As soon as any rumor of a return to the front ran through the regiment, the facial expressions changed, and discontent, strain, and morose unfriendliness came uppermost. The mortal weariness and strain made themselves felt and engendered moral instability and apathy. Lisnitsky knew well how terrible man can be when dominated by such a mood, he struggles to some purpose. In 1915, he had seen a company of soldiers sent five times into attack, suffering terrible losses, and still receiving again and again the command to renew the offensive. The remnants of the company had at last arbitrarily withdrawn from the sector and had marched towards the rear. Lisnitsky's company had been ordered to stop them, and when, spreading out in a chain, the Cossacks had attempted to halt the movement, the soldiers had opened fire. Not more than sixty of them were left, and Lisnitsky had noted the senselessly desperate bravery with which these sixty had defended themselves, had fallen under the Cossacks' sabers, marching on to death, to destruction, resolved that it mattered not where death came to them. The incident had left its menacing memory, and Lisnitsky anxiously and fearfully studied the Cossacks' faces, wondering whether they also would turn round one day and retreat, restrained by nothing but death, and as he noticed their tired, sullen glances, he had to admit that they would. The Cossacks had changed radically since the early days of the war. Even their songs were new, born of the war and expressing a somber joylessness. As he passed by the spacious shed of the factory in which his company was quartered, he most frequently heard one yearning, indescribably mournful song. Lisnitsky would stop to listen, and the simple sorrow of the song would move him strongly. A string was tautened with the increasing beat of his heart, and the low timbre of the voice plucked the string, setting it vibrating painfully. Lisnitsky would stand a little way off, staring into the autumnal gloom of the evening and feeling his eyes moisten with tears. Only once during the whole time the regiment was resting did Lisnitsky hear the brave words of an old Cossack song. He was returning from his usual evening stroll, and as he passed the shed, a noise and the sounds of half-drunken voices reached his ears. He guessed that the quartermaster sergeant, who had been to the neighboring town for provisions, had brought back some illicit spirits and had treated the Cossacks. And now they were quarreling and laughing at something or other. He heard the wild and piercing whistle of the Cossacks and the strong melody of the song when still some way off. He involuntarily smiled as he listened and tried to bring his steps into time with the rhythm. I don't suppose the infantry yearn for home so strongly as the Cossacks, he thought, but cold reason objected that the infantry soldier was no different. Yet undoubtedly the Cossacks reacted more painfully to the enforced sitting in the trenches, for the very nature of their service had accustomed them to the continual movement. And for two years they had been engaged in trench warfare, or in marking time in one spot in continual, fruitless attempts to advance. Even so, they would hold out. If they did break down, they would be the last to do so. They were a little nation in themselves, military by tradition, and not factory or peasant riffraff. As though deliberately to undeceive him, a strained voice began to sing another song. Other Cossacks took it up, and once more Lisnitsky heard the Cossacks yearning translated into song. The young officer prays to God. The young Cossack asks to go home. Oh, young officer, let me go home. Let me go home to my father, to my father and mother, and my young wife. <laughs>
Chapter 11 The zone from Vladimir Valhinsk to Kovel in Valhynia was held by the Special Army. The Special Army was really number 13, but as even generals of high rank suffered from superstitious prejudices, it was called the Special Army. During the early days of October 1916, plans were made for an advance in this area, and the way was prepared with artillery operations. The command of the 80th Army Corps of the Special Army was instructed to throw two divisions into the area of the offensive. Among those transferred was the 318th Chornogorsk Regiment. The regiment was withdrawn from the front line on the Stokhod River at night, and after a demonstrative movement in the opposite direction, turned round and marched back behind the lines towards the active zone. Next morning, the regiment was distributed through a forest in abandoned dugouts, and here for four days they were instructed in the French method of attack, advancing in half companies instead of battalions. Then they marched on again. For three days they passed through forests, through glades, along wild woodland paths scarred with the marks of cannon wheels. A light patchy mist stirred by the wind flowed and clung to the tops of the pines and eddied among the firs over the blue-green of the steaming marshes. A drizzling rain fell continually, and the men were wet through and in sullen mood. They reached a village not far from the zone of the offensive and rested for some days, preparing for the mortal journey. At the same time, a special Cossack company, accompanied by the staff of the 80th Division, was moving down towards the scene of the battle. In the company were second reserve Cossacks from Tatarsk village, and the second troop was entirely composed of them. There were the two brothers of armless Alexei Shamil, the former mill engine man Ivan Alexeyevich, Afonka Ozirov, the former Ottoman Manitskov, and many others. Early on the morning of October 16th, the company entered a village just as the 1st Battalion of the Chornogorsk Regiment was preparing to march out. The soldiers were running out of the abandoned, half-ruined huts and assembling in the street. The Cossacks came down the left side of the street. Ivan Alexeyevich, the engine man, was on the outside file in one of the ranks of the second troop. He was marching with his eyes fixed on the ground in an attempt to avoid the puddles. Someone called to him from the ranks of the infantry, and he turned his head and passed his eyes over the soldiers. Ivan Alexeyevich, old friend! A little soldier broke away from his platoon and came running towards him, throwing his rifle back over his shoulder but the sling slipped and the butt jangled against his mess tin. Don't you know me? Forgotten me already? the soldier cried. With difficulty, Ivan Alexeyevich recognized Valyat in the soldier with mouth and chin covered with a bristling, smoky gray beard. Where have you sprung from? he asked. I'm in this regiment, the 318th Chornogorsk. I never, never hoped to meet any of my old friends here. Still gripping Valyat's dirty little hand in his own bony fist, Ivan Alexeyevich smiled gladly and agitatedly. Valyat hurried to keep up with the Cossack stride and began to trot, looking up into Ivan's eyes, while the gaze of his own close-set evil little eyes was unusually tender and moist. We're going into an attack, and so are we. Well, how are you getting on, Ivan Alexeyevich? There's nothing to tell. The same here. I haven't been out of the trenches since 1914. Do you remember Stockman? He was a lad, was our Osip Davidovich. He'd tell us what it was all about. He was a man if ever there was one. Do I remember him, Valyat cried, shaking his tiny fist and crinkling his little bristly face into a smile. I remember him better than my own father. You never heard how he got on, did you? He's in Siberia, Ivan Alexeyevich sighed. How? Valyat asked bobbing up and down beside his friend and turning up his foxy ear. He's in prison. For all I know, he may be dead now. Valyat walked along without speaking for a moment or two, now looking back to where his company was assembling, then gazing up at Ivan's chin and the deep round dimple right under the lower lip. Goodbye, he said, releasing his hand from Ivan's. I don't suppose we shall be seeing each other again. With his left hand, the Cossack removed his cap and bending down, he put his arms round Valyat's shoulders. They kissed each other strongly, as though saying goodbye forever, and Valyat dropped back. His head suddenly sank on his breast, so that only the dark rosy tips of his ears emerged from his grey greatcoat.
He turned back, huddled up, and stumbling over his feet. Ivan Alexeyevich broke away from the rank and called with a quiver in his voice. Hey, brother, brother, you were bitter, weren't you? Do you remember? You were a strong one, eh? Huh? Valyat turned his tear-stained face and beat his fist on his bony breast through his open greatcoat and torn shirt. I was. I was hard. But they've crushed me now. They've driven the old horse to death. He shouted something else, but the Cossack company turned into a side street, and Ivan lost sight of him. As the Cossacks marched out of the village, they began to fall in with wounded, at first in ones and twos, then in groups of several at a time, at last in entire droves. Several carts, filled to overflowing with serious cases, dragged slowly along. The mares, pulling at the traces, were terribly emaciated. Their skinny backs revealed the marks of incessant whipping, and in places the bones showed through the wounds. They hauled the carts along with difficulty, snorting and straining, with their nostrils almost touching the mud. Occasionally one would stop, her sunken sides heaving impotently, and her head hanging despondently. A blow of a whip would stir her from the spot, and she would drag on again, swaying from side to side. All around the carts, wounded men were clinging, assisting themselves along. The Cossack company turned off the road and entered the forest. Until evening they were huddled together under the streaming pines. The rain leaked beneath their collars and wandered down their backs. They were forbidden to strike any lights, but in any case it would have been difficult to do so in the rain. As dusk was falling they were led off into a trench, not very deep, hardly more than a man's height, it was flooded with water and stank of slime, of sodden pine cones, and the moist, velvety soft smell of rain. From the trench the company was led on again through the darkling pine forest. They marched along, endeavoring to encourage one another with jest. Someone began to whistle. In a small glade they came upon a long trail of corpses, the bodies lay flung down, shoulder to shoulder, in various frequently horrible and indecent postures. A soldier armed with a rifle, a gas mask hanging from his belt, stood on guard over them. The Cossacks were led close to the bodies, and they caught the cloying scent of decay already coming from them. The company commander halted the company, went with the troop officers up to the soldier, and stood talking to him for a minute or two. Meantime, the Cossacks broke rank and went over to the bodies, removing their caps and staring down at the forms with that feeling of secret, fluttering fear and bestial curiosity which all living beings experience before the mystery of the dead. The bodies were those of officers, and the Cossacks counted forty-seven of them. The majority were youngsters between twenty and twenty-five years old, judging by their looks, only the one on the extreme right who was wearing the epaulets of a staff captain was elderly. His mouth was wide open, concealing the mute echoes of his last cry in its yawning depths. Above it hung heavy black whiskers. The broad brows frowned across his deathly pallid face. Two or more of them had no covering to their heads. The Cossacks stood staring long at the figure of one lieutenant, handsome even in death. He lay on his back, his left arm pressed against his chest, his right flung out and holding a pistol in an everlasting grip. Evidently someone had tried to take the weapon away. His broad yellow wrist was scratched, but the steel had fused to his hand, and they would never be separated. On his curly flaxen hair was a broken cap. His face was pressed cheek downward to the earth, as though fondling it and his orange-bluish lips were contemptuously, amazedly writhed. His right-hand neighbor lay face downward, his great coat hummocked on his back with its tail torn away, revealing his strong legs with their tautened muscles in khaki-colored trousers and short chrome yellow boots, the heels twisted to one side. He had no cap, nor had he the upper part of his cranium, for it had been cut away clean by a shard of shrapnel. In the empty brain pan, framed by damp strands of hair, glimmered rose-colored rainwater. Next to him lay a stout little officer in an open leather jerkin and a torn shirt. His lower jaw rested crookedly on his bare breast, 
below the hair of his head glimmered a narrow white band of forehead with the skin burnt and shriveled into a little tube. Between the brow and the jaw were merely pieces of bone and a thick black and crimson mash. Beyond these were carelessly gathered pieces of limbs, rags of overcoats, a crushed leg where the head should have been. Then came a boy with full lips and a charming oval face. A stream of machine gun bullets had swept across his chest. His great coat was holed in four places, and burnt knobs of flesh were sticking through the holes. Who, who was he calling for in his hour of death? His mother? Ivan Alexeyevich stuttered with chattering teeth and turned sharply away, stumbling as though blind. The Cossacks hurriedly returned to their places, crossing themselves and not glancing back. They preserved a long silence as they passed on through the narrow glades, hastening to get away from the memory of what they had seen. After some time, the company was halted close to a dense network of abandoned dugouts. The officers entered one of the dugouts, and the men stood at ease. Darkness closed over the forest. The wind sent the clouds scurrying and tore them apart to reveal the lilac points of the distant stars. Meantime, the commander assembled the officers in the dugout and, opening a packet by the light of a stump of candle, acquainted them with the instructions of the staff command. While the Cossacks were resting in the dugouts, the 1st Battalion of the Chornogorsk Regiment passed in front of them. The dense forest was heavily holed with shells. The soldiers marched cautiously, feeling the ground with their feet. Occasionally someone would fall and curse under his breath. Valiet was in the company on the extreme right and was sixth from the end of the long file. Hey, neighbor, someone suddenly whispered to the left of him. Hello, he replied. Going all right? All right, Valiet said, immediately stumbling and sitting down in a shell hole filled with water. It's dark. Devilish dark, he heard on his left. They went on for a minute or two, invisible to each other. Then unexpectedly the same hissing voice whispered right into Valiot's ear, Let's go together. It isn't so bad, then. They went on in silence, setting their waterlogged boots cautiously down on the slippery earth. Suddenly a horned and spotted moon broke from behind the clouds, breasting the misty waves like a boat, emerging into clear sky, it poured down a flood of uncertain light. The damp pine needles gleamed phosphorescently in its light, and the cones seemed to smell more strongly, and the wet soil to breathe more coolly. They hurried along to overtake the file of men, but in the darkness they missed them and somehow got in front. After wandering on for some time, they jumped down into a dark cleft of trench zigzagging off into the darkness. Let's search the dugouts. We may find something to eat, Valiet's comrade proposed irresolutely. All right. You go to the right and I'll take the left. We'll search while the others are coming up. Valiet struck a match and stepped through the open doorway of the first dugout he found. But he flew out again as though expelled by a catapult. Inside, two dead bodies lay crossed one on the other. He searched three dugouts fruitlessly and flung open the door of a fourth, all but collapsing as he heard a strange metallic voice speaking German. Who is that? His body tingling, Valiet silently jumped back. Is that you, Otto? Why have you been so long? The German asked, stepping out of the dugout and carelessly adjusting his greatcoat across his shoulders. Hands up! Hands up! Surrender! Valiet shouted hoarsely. Mute with astonishment, the German slowly raised his hands, turned sideways, and stared fixedly at the gleaming point of the bayonet presented at him. His great coat fell from his shoulders, his big, work-scarred hands trembled above his head, and the fingers stirred as though playing on invisible strings of fear. Valiet stood without changing his position, gazing at the tall, stalwart form of the German, the metal buttons of his tunic, the short boots and the peakless cap set slightly on one side. Suddenly changing his attitude, he swayed as though being shaken out of his greatcoat, emitted a curt, throaty sound, neither cough nor wheeze, and stepped towards the German. Run, he said in a hollow, broken voice. Run, German, I've got no grudge against you. I won't shoot. He leant his rifle against the wall of the trench and, rising on tiptoe, stretched his hand up to the right hand of the German. His confident movements reassured the man who dropped his hand and listened intently to the unfamiliar intonation of the Russian's voice.
Without hesitation, Violet gave him his own hairy, labor-worn hand and squeezed the German's cold, limp fingers. Then he lifted the palm. The light of the moon fell on it and revealed the brown calluses. I'm a worker, Valyet said, trembling with his smile as though with the ague. What should I kill you for? Run. He gently pushed the German's shoulder and pointed to the black outline of the forest. Run, you fool. Our men will be here soon. The German stood staring at Valyet's outflung hand, his body a little forward, his ears straining to catch the sense of the incomprehensible words. So he stood for a second or two, his eyes meeting Valyet's, then suddenly a joyous smile quivered on his lips. Stepping backward a pace, he threw out his arms, strongly squeezed Valyet's hands, and shook them, smiling agitatedly and staring into the Russian's eyes. You're letting me go? Oh, now I understand. You're a Russian worker, a social democrat like me. Yes, my brother, how can I ever forget? I cannot find words. But you're a fine lad, I... Amid the boiling torrent of foreign words, Valyet caught the one familiar social democrat. He swept his yellow palm across and slapped it against his chest. Yes, I'm a social democrat. You've guessed right, old lad. And now run. Goodbye, brother. Give me your hand. We're brothers, you know, and brothers shouldn't part like this. Strongly moved, intuitively understanding each other, they stood with clasped hands, staring into each other's eyes. From the forest came the sounds of the approaching chain of Russians. The German whispered, In the coming class struggle we shall be in the same trenches, shan't we, comrade? Then he leapt like a great gray animal onto the breastwork. A moment or two later the file of Russian soldiers came up, a Czech reconnaissance party with the officers at their head. They all but fired at Valyet's companion as he crawled out of a dugout. I'm Russian, can't you see? he cried frantically, hugging a loaf of black bread to his breast as he saw the barrel of a rifle pointed at him. Just before dawn, the Czech reconnaissance party ran up against a German observation post. At equal intervals, they fired two more volleys. Over the trenches soared a crimson rocket, and its purple sparks had hardly died away when the German artillery opened fire. The sound of the exploding shells came from far behind the Russian forces, somewhere by the Stochod River. As soon as the first shot was fired, the company, moving up nearly a hundred yards behind the Czechs, threw itself down headlong. The rocket shed a ruddy glow over the ground. By its light, Valyet saw the soldiers crawling like ants among the bushes and trees, no longer careful of the muddy soil, but pressing against it in their search for protection. The men heaped around every rut, disappeared behind every tiny earthy mound, thrust their heads into every little hole. Nevertheless, when the stuttering machine-gun fire luxuriantly flooded the forest like a May downpour, they could not hold their positions their heads buried between their shoulders, clinging like caterpillars to the ground, moving without stirring an arm or a leg, creeping like snakes and leaving their faces in the mud behind them, they crawled back. Some jumped to their feet and ran, lashing up the cones, splintering the pines, the exploding bullets skipped and tore through the forest, rending into the earth, hissing like serpents. Seventeen men were missing from the first half-company of the Chornogorsk Regiment when it reached the second line of trenches again. A little way off, the Cossacks of the Special Company were also assembling. They had advanced on the right of the Chornogorsk half-company, had moved cautiously, and might have taken the Germans by surprise, overwhelming the outposts. But when the fire was opened on the Czechs, the Germans were put on the alert along the entire sector, Firing at random, the enemy had killed two Cossacks and wounded another. Within half an hour, a further order came from the regimental staff. After the ground had been prepared by an artillery bombardment, the Chornogorsk Regiment and the Special Cossack Company were again to attack the enemy and to drive him out of the first line of trenches. Chapter 12 Twenty-five miles lower down the Stokhod, the river of a hundred ways, the battle was raging. For three weeks the roar of the artillery had continued without ceasing. Of nights the distant violet heaven was shredded with the rays of searchlights, sowing dim rainbow beams, infecting with inexplicable uneasiness those who watched from afar 
the flames and explosions of war. Meantime, the 12th Cossack Regiment, to which Gregor's company belonged, was holding a wild and swampy sector. By day, they fired occasional shots at the Austrians lining the shallow trenches opposite. By night, protected by the marsh, they slept or played cards. Only the guards watched the fitful orange outbursts of light where the struggle was being continued, some twenty-five miles lower down the Stochard River. On one of those tingling frosty nights when the distant reflections flickered more clearly than usual against the sky, Gregor Melyukov left his dugout and made his way along a communication trench into the forest, which stood out behind the trenches in a gray brush over the black skull of a low hill. He flung himself down on the spacious, scented earth. The air was stifling and oppressive in the dugout. A brown tobacco smoke hung like a shaggy blanket over a table around which eight Cossacks were playing cards. But through the forest on the hill crest a breeze was blowing, quietly as though fanned from the wings of invisible passing birds. A mournful scent arose from the frost-bitten grasses. Above the shell-sheared forest gathered the darkness. The smoking fire of the Pleiades was burning out in the sky. The great bear lay to one side of the Milky Way, like an overturned wane with the shaft sticking up. In the north, the pole star gleamed with a steady fading light. Gregor stared up at the star, and its icy light, dim yet strangely prickling to the eyes, caused cold tears to spring beneath his eyelashes. A rush of memory brought all the past years of the war vividly before him. He recalled the night when he had gone to Aksinya at Yagodnaya. He remembered her with sudden pain, the dear yet alien outlines of her face appearing uncertainly before him. With beating heart he tried to recall that face as he had seen it for the last time, distorted with pain, the livid mark of the knout on her cheek. But memory persistently suggested another face, held slightly on one side and smiling pallidly. Now again Oxenia turned her face confidently and amorously, looking up at him with fiery black eyes, her depravedly avid crimson lips whispering something inexpressibly caressing. Then she slowly turned her eyes, her head, away from him, and he saw the two fluffy curls on her swarthy neck, how he had loved to kiss them. Gregor shuddered. For a moment he thought he could even smell the fine, intoxicating aroma of Oxenia's hair, and he dilated his nostrils. But no, it was the troubling scent of fallen leaves. The oval of Oxenia's face faded and passed. He closed his eyes, pressed his palm to the rough skin of the earth, and lay staring unwinkingly beyond the broken pines at the pole star, hanging like a blue butterfly in motionless flight. Other memories obscured Oxenia's features. He recalled the weeks he had spent at Tatarsk with his family after his break with Oxenia, of nights Natalia's greedy, ravaging embraces as though she were trying to make up for her previous virgin iciness. During the days, the watchful and almost challenging attitude of his family and the respect with which the villagers greeted their first cavalier of St. George. Everywhere, even in his own home, Gregor caught sidelong, astonished and respectful glances. They examined him as though they could not believe it was the same Gregor who had been such a self-willed and merry lad. The old men talked to him as an equal and took off their hats when they met him. The girls and women stared with unconcealed admiration at his trim, slightly stooping figure and the cross on his breast. He noticed how obviously his father was proud of him as they walked together to church or to the square. And all this subtle, complex poison of flattery, respect, and admiration gradually submerged and erased from his consciousness the truth which Garanja had implanted. Gregor returned to Tatarsk one man and went back to the front another. His own Cossack national traditions, sucked in with his mother's milk and loved all his life, rose above the greater human truth. I knew you'd make a good Cossack, Kriegar, old Pantelyemon had said, stroking his black and silver beard as they parted. When you were twelve months old, I carried you out into the yard and sat you bareback on a horse, as is the good old Cossack custom. And you, you little devil, you just seized him by the mane with your tiny hands. I said then you'd make good. 
and so you have. Gregor returned to the front, a good Cossack. Mentally still unreconciled to the senselessness of war, nonetheless he faithfully defended his Cossack honor. In May 1915, the 13th German Iron Regiment had advanced over a brilliantly green meadow close to the village of Alhostchik. The machine guns rattled away like cicadas. The heavy machine gun of the Russian regiment ensconced along the rivulet stuttered powerfully. The 12th Cossack Regiment bore the brunt of the German attack. While waiting for the oncoming enemy, Grigor glanced back and saw the molten orb of the sun in the midday sky and another sun in the reedy rivulet. Beyond the river, beyond the poplars, were the Cossack horses, and in front was the German line, the yellow gleam of the copper eagles on the helmets. A wind billowed the bluish wormwood smoke of the gunfire. Grigor fired unhurriedly, taking careful aim and listening between his shots to the troop commander shouting the range. He cautiously dislodged a ladybird that settled on his sleeve. Then came the attack. With his rifle butt, Grigor knocked a tall German lieutenant off his feet, took three prisoners, and firing over their heads, forced them to run towards the rivulet. In July 1915, with a Cossack troop, he had recovered a battery captured by the Austrians. During the same battle, he had worked his way to the rear of the enemy and had opened fire on them with a portable machine gun, putting the advancing Austrians to flight. Then he had taken a corpulent officer prisoner, flinging him across his saddlebow as if he had been a sheep. As he lay on the hillside, Grigor particularly remembered one incident in which he had met his deadly enemy, Stepan Astachov. The 12th Regiment had been withdrawn from the front and flung into eastern Prussia. The Cossack horses had trampled the orderly German fields. The Cossacks had fired the German habitations. Along the road they traveled, a ruddy smoke had risen, and the charred walls and the tiled roofs had crumbled to dust. Near the town of Stalipin, the regiment went into attack at the side of the 27th Don Cossack Regiment. Grigor caught a momentary glimpse of his brother, a clean-shaven Stepan and other Cossacks from his own village. The regiments suffered defeat and were surrounded by the Germans. When the twelve companies, one after another, were flinging themselves into the attack in order to break through the enemy ring, Grigor saw Stepan leap from the horse killed beneath him and circle around like a wolf. Fired by a sudden joyous resolve, Grigor reined in his horse, and when the last company had galloped past, all but trampling on Stepan, he rode up to him and shouted, Catch hold of my stirrup! Stepan seized the stirrup strap and ran for half a mile at the side of Grigor's horse. Don't ride too fast, not too fast, for the love of Christ, he pleaded, his mouth gaping and panting. They passed successfully through the breach in the German ring, not more than two hundred yards separated them from the forest to which their companies had retreated when a bullet whipped Stepan off his feet, and he fell headlong. The wind tore the cap from Gregor's head and sent his hair into his eyes. Brushing it back, he looked round and saw Stepan limp towards a bush, tear off his Cossack cap, sit down, and hurriedly unbutton his trousers. From beyond the hill, the Germans came running, Grigor realized that Stepan had no wish to die, and so was tearing off his trousers, knowing that the Germans would show a Cossack no mercy. Mastering the beating of his heart, he turned his horse round and galloped back to the bush, jumping off while the horse was moving. Get on my horse, he ordered Stepan. Unforgettable was the curt sweep of Stepan's eyes as Grigor helped him to mount, then ran at his side, holding onto the stirrup. A stream of bullets whistled over their heads, and on either side and behind them sounded the spurting shots like the splitting of overripe acacia pods. In the forest, Stepan, his face twisted with pain, slipped down from the saddle and limped away. Through the leg of his right boot, blood was flowing, and at every step a cherry red little stream spurted from his broken soul. He leant against the trunk of a spreading oak and beckoned to Gregor. My boot's full of blood, he said, when Grigor went across to him. Grigor was silent, gazing aside. Grishka, when we went into the attack today, do you hear, Grigor? Stepan said, attempting to look into his enemy's eyes. When we went into the attack, I fired three times at you from behind. God stopped me from killing you. Their eyes met. Stepan's keen pupils gleamed insufferably in their sunken sockets,
He spoke almost without stirring his lips. You've saved me from death. Thank you. But I can't forgive you for Axenia. My soul won't try. Don't force me, Gregor. I shan't force you, Gregor answered. They had parted enemies as before. In May, the regiment, with other sections of the Brusilov army, had broken through the front at Lutsk and had carouseled in the enemy's rear, striking and being struck. By Lvov, Gregor had himself drawn his company into an attack and had beaten back an Austrian howitzer battery. One night, nearly a month later, he had swum across the Boog River and had sent a sentry flying, and they had struggled a long time in the darkness before Gregor could bind him. Strongly had Gregor defended his Cossack honor, seizing every opportunity of displaying immortal prowess, risking his life in madcap adventures, changing his clothes and making to the rear of the enemy, capturing outposts, and feeling that the pain for other men which had oppressed him during the first days of the war had gone forever. His heart had grown hard, dry like a salt marsh in drought. As a marsh will not absorb water, so Gregor's heart would not absorb compassion. With cold contempt he played with his own and others' lives, and covered himself with glory. He had won four St. George crosses and four other medals. On the occasional parades he stood by the regimental banner, seasoned with the gunpowder smoke of innumerable wars. But he knew that he no longer laughed as in former days, that his eyes were sunken and his cheekbones stood out sharply. He knew what price he had paid for his crosses and medals. He lay on the hillside, the edges of his great coat turned under him, resting on his left elbow. His memory obediently resurrected the past, and among the throng of memories some distant incident of his youth was entwined like a fine blue thread. For a moment he rested his mental eye upon it sadly and lovingly, then returned to the present. In the Austrian trenches someone was playing a mandolin. The fine, wind-billowed strains hurried across the Stochard River, scattering lightly over the earth so often washed with human blood. In the zenith the stars flamed, but the darkness was deepening, and a midnight mist was bowed over the marsh. He smoked two cigarettes in succession, then rose from the hospitable earth and went back to the trenches. In his dugout, the men were still playing cards. Gregor dropped onto his pallet and fell off to sleep. In his sleep, he dreamed of the parched, interminable steppe, the rosy lilac of the immortelles, the traces of unshod horses' hoofs among the shaggy lilac thyme. The step was empty and terrifyingly quiet. He was walking over the hard, sandy ground, but he could not hear his own footfalls, and this alarmed him. He awoke for a moment and raised his head, chewing his lips like a horse that has momentarily caught the aroma of some unusual herb. Then he fell asleep again into an untroubled, dreamless sleep. Next day he awoke with an inexplicable, sucking yearning troubling him. What are you fasting for today? Dreamed about home last night? Uryupin asked him. You guessed right. I dreamed of the steppe. I'm so worn out in spirit. I'd like to be back home. I'm fed up with the Tsar's service. Uryupin smiled condescendingly. He had lived continually in one dugout with Gregor, and had that respect for him which one strong animal feels for another. Since their quarrel in 1914, there had been no conflict between them, and Uryupin's influence was clearly discernible in Gregor's changed character and psychology. The war had strongly modified Uryupin's outlook. And Quiet Flows the Dawn, by Mikhail Sholokhov, continued. The war had strongly modified Uryupin's outlook. He dully but unswervingly turned towards an anti-war attitude, talked a great deal about traitor generals and the Germans in the Tsar's palace. Once he had muttered, Don't expect any good to come of it when the Tsaritsa herself is of German blood. Gregor had tried to explain Garanja's teachings to him,
but Uryupin would have none of it. The song's all right, but the voice is throaty, he had said with a humorous smile. Misha Kashevoy is always crowing the same story like a cock on a wall. There's no sense ever comes from these revolutions, only mischief. You remember that what the Cossacks need is their own government and not any other. We need a strong Tsar like Nikolai Nikolaevich. We've got nothing in common with the peasants. The goose and the swine are not comrades. The peasants want to get the land for themselves. The workers want to have higher wages. But what will they give us? Land we've got in plenty. Uh-huh. And what else do we need? Our Tsar's a horseradish. There's no use denying it. His father was stronger. But this one will wait till revolution is knocking at the door as it did in 1905, and then they'll go rolling down to the devil together. That's not to our hand. Once they've driven the Tsar out, they'll be coming on us. Here the old fights will break out again. There they'll begin to take our land away for the peasants. We must keep our ears pricked. You always think one-sidedly, Grigor frowned. You're talking nonsense. You're young yet. You've not seen the world. But you wait a little and you'll find out who's right. The argument usually ended at that, Grigor lapsing into silence and Uryupin attempting to talk about something else. That day, Grigor was drawn into an unfortunate incident. At midday, the field kitchen stopped on the farther side of the hill as usual. The Cossacks pressed on one another along the communication trench to the kitchen. Misha Kashevoy went to get the food for the third troop and came back carrying the steaming pots on a long pole. He had hardly entered the dugout when he shouted, This isn't good enough, brothers. Are we dogs or what? What's up, Uryupin asked. They're feeding us on dead horse, Kashevoy exclaimed indignantly. Throwing back his head of golden hair, he set the pots down on a bed and suggested, glancing sidelong at Uryupin, Smell for yourself what the soup stinks like. Uryupin bent over his pot and distended his nostrils. He started back and pulled a wry face. Kushevoy also frowned and his nostrils quivered in involuntary imitation of Uryupin. The meat's gone bad, Uryupin decided. He pushed the pot away fastidiously and looked at Grigor. Grigor rose from his bed, bent his already hooked nose over the soup, then flung himself away, and with a lazy movement sent the nearest pot to the ground. What have you done that for? Uryupin asked irresolutely. Don't you see what for? Look, are you half blind? What's that? Grigor pointed to the muddy wash oozing over the floor. Here, worms, my old mother, and I didn't see them. There's a fine dinner for you. That's not cabbage soup. That's vermicelli, worms instead of giblets, Uryupin exclaimed. For a moment there was silence. Grigor spat through his teeth. Then Kushevoy drew his saber and said, We'll arrest this soup and report it to the company commander. That's the idea, Uryupin approved. We'll take the soup and you, Grigor, must come behind and make the report. With their bayonets, Uryupin and Kushevoy picked up a pot of soup, then drew their sabers. Grigor followed behind them, and as they passed along the trenches, a line of inquisitive Cossacks gathered in a gray-green wave and followed them. They halted outside the officer's dugout. Grigor stooped, and holding his cap on with his left hand, entered the foxhole. After a moment, the company commander came out, buttoning up his overcoat and looking back at Grigor in astonishment, mingled with a hint of anxiety. "'What's the matter, boys?' The officer ran his eyes over the assembled Cossacks. Grigor stepped in front of him and replied, We've brought a prisoner. What prisoner? That, he pointed to the pot of soup at Uryupin's feet. There's the prisoner. Smell what your Cossacks are being fed on. They've started to serve out dead horse, Misha Kushevoy exclaimed fiercely. Change the quartermaster. The soup's got worms in it, other shouts arose. The officer waited until the howl of voices had died down, then said sternly, Silence! You've said enough. I'll change the quartermaster today. I'll appoint a commission to investigate his activities. If the meat isn't good, court-martial him, came a shout from behind, and the officer's voice was drowned in a new storm of cries. The quartermaster had to be changed while the regiment was on the march. A few hours after the Cossacks had arrested the soup and brought it before the company commander, the order was received to withdraw from the front and to move by forced marches into Romania.
During the night, the Cossacks were relieved by Siberian sharpshooters. The next day, the regiment was mounted and on its way. The march took 17 days. The horses were exhausted with shortage of fodder. There was no food anywhere along the devastated zone immediately behind the front. The inhabitants had either fled into the interior or hidden in the forests. The gaping doors of the huts gloomily revealed bare walls. Occasionally the Cossacks would fall in with a sullen, terrified villager in a deserted street, but as soon as he saw the soldiers he hastened to hide himself. Worn out with their unbroken march, frozen and irritable because of all they had had to endure, they tore off the straw roofs of the buildings. In villages still unrifled by others, they did not hesitate to steal the miserable food, and no threats on the part of their officers could stop them. Not far from the Romanian frontier, Uryupin succeeded in stealing some barley from a barn in some more affluent village. The owner caught him in the act, but he knocked the peaceable elderly Bessarabian down and carried the barley to his horse. The troop officer found him filling his horse's blanket and with trembling fingers stroked the animal's sunken bony sides. Uryupin, hand over that barley, you swine. You'll be shot for this, the officer shouted. Uryupin gave the officer a sidelong glance and threw his cap down on the ground. For the first time during all his life in the regiment, he raised a heart-rending cry. Court-martial me! Shoot me! Kill me on the spot, but I won't give up the barley. Is my horse to die of hunger? Eh? I won't hand over the barley, not a single grain. The officer stood without replying, staring at the horse's terribly emaciated flanks and shaking his head. Finally, he remarked with a note of perplexity in his voice, What are you giving the horse grain for when he's still hot? But he's cooled down now, Uryupin replied almost in a whisper, gathering up the grains fallen on the ground and putting them back in the basket. The regiment arrived at its new position in the middle of November. The winds were howling over the Transylvanian mountains. A freezing mist gathered in the valleys, and the traces of animals were frequently seen on the early snows. Terrified by the war, the wolves, elks, and goats were abandoning their wild fastnesses and making for the interior of the country. On November 20th, the regiment attempted to storm Height 320. The previous evening, the trenches had been held by Austrians. But on the morning of the attack, they were relieved by Saxons, freshly transferred from the Western Front. The Cossacks marched on foot up the stony, slightly snow-covered slopes, sending the stones rolling down and raising a fine, snowy dust. As Grigor strode along, he smiled guiltily and sheepishly, and told Uryupin, I'm quite nervous this morning, for some reason. I feel just as though I was going into battle for the first time. The Cossacks marched up the slope in irregular chain formation. Not a shot was fired. The enemy trenches were ominously silent. Grigor was smiling anxiously. His hook nose and his sunken cheeks with their black harvest of whisker were a yellowish blue. His eyes gleamed dully like pieces of anthracite beneath his rime-covered brows. His accustomed composure had deserted him. Today, as never before, he was anxious for himself and for his comrades. He felt as though he wanted to throw himself on the ground and weep, complaining with childish phrases to the earth as if it were his mother. He fixed a distrustful gaze on the gray, snow-fringed line of trenches ahead, and struggling with the terrible feeling, mastering his tears, he talked away to Uryupin. The very first volley from the enemy knocked Grigor over, and he fell to the ground with a groan. He tried to reach the first aid dressing in his pack, but the hot blood pouring from the elbow inside his sleeve left him too weak. He lay flat, and shielding his head behind a boulder, licked the downy fringe of snow with his parched tongue, and thirstily caught at the snowy dust with quivering lips. He listened with unusual fear and trembling to the dry, sharp crack of the rifles and the dominating thunder of the guns. Raising his head, he saw the Cossacks of his company running back down the slope, slipping, falling, aimlessly firing backward and upward. An inexplicable and irrational fear brought him to his feet, and forced him also to run down towards the serrated edging of the pine forest whence the regiment had opened the attack. The companies poured in torrents into the forest. 
On the gray slopes behind them lay little gray bundles of dead. The wounded crawled down unaided, whipped along by the fierce machine gun fire. Leaning on Misha Koshevoy's arm, Grigor entered the forest. The bullets ricocheted off the sloping ground. On the German's left flank, a machine gun was spitting out a fine hail, sounding as though stones, flung by a strong hand, were ringingly bouncing off the thin ice of a frozen river. They're giving us a warm time, Uryupin shouted almost exultantly. Leaning against the ruddy breast of a pine, he fired lazily at the Germans pouring over the ridge of the trenches. This will teach the fools. This will teach them, Kushavoy shouted, tearing his arm away from Gregor. The people are swines, swines. When they've poured out all their blood, then they'll learn what they're being shot down for. What are you raving about, Uryupin frowned. If you're wise, you can understand for yourself. But the fools, what of them? You can't drive sense into their heads even with a hammer. Do you remember your oath? Did you take the oath or not, Uryupin demanded. Instead of replying, Koshevoy fell to his knees and with fumbling hands raked up some snow. He swallowed it greedily, shivering and coughing the while. Chapter 13 Through the sky, flecked with a gray ripple of cloud, the autumn sun rolled over Tatarsk. In the heaven, a gentle breeze urged the clouds slowly on towards the west, but over the village, over the dark green plain of the Don Valley, over the bare forest, it blew strongly, bending the crowns of the willows and poplars, ruffling the dawn, and chasing droves of crimson leaves along the streets. In Christonia's threshing floor, it tousled a badly stacked rick of wheat straw, tearing away its top and sending the thin ridge pole flying. Suddenly snatching up a golden load of straw, as if on a pitchfork, it carried the burden out into the yard, sent it whirling across the street, and scattered it munificently over the deserted road, finally throwing the untidy bundle onto the roof of Stepanastachov's hut. Christonia's wife ran out into the yard and stood for a minute or two watching the wind lording it about the threshing floor, then went in again. The third year of the war had left noticeable marks in the village, where the huts had been deprived of all male hands, the sheds gaped wide open, the yards were shabby, and gradual decay was leaving its traces everywhere. Christonia's wife had only her little nine-year-old son to help her. Anikushka's wife was no hand whatever at farm work, and because of her lonely situation, paid redoubled attention to her own appearance, painted her face with a veneer of beauty, and as there were not enough grown-up Cossacks, accepted lads of fourteen or so. The state of her long, untired gates witnessed eloquently to the neglect of the farm. Stepan Astakhov's hut was completely abandoned. The owner had boarded up the windows, the roof was falling in and was overgrown with burdocks. The door lock was rusting, and wandering cattle strayed through the open gate, seeking shelter from the heat or rain in the weedy, grass-grown yard. The wall of Ivan Tamilin's hut was falling into the street, being kept from doing so only by a forked wooden prop. Fate seemed to be wreaking its vengeance on the hardy artillerymen for the German and Russian houses he had destroyed. And so in all the streets and alleys of the village. At the lower end, only Pantelyem and Melikov's hut and yard had their usual appearance. There everything seemed sound and in order. Yet it was not entirely so. On the granary roof, the sheet-iron cocks had fallen, eaten away with age. The granary was sinking on one side, and an experienced eye would have detected other signs of neglect. The old man could not manage everything. He sowed less and less, and only the Myelyakov family itself did not diminish. To make up for Pyotr and Grigor's absence, Natalia gave birth to twins in the autumn of 1915. She was clever enough to please both Pantelyemon and Ilinichna by having a girl and a boy. Natalia's childbearing was a painful one. There were whole days when she could hardly walk owing to the tormenting pains in her legs, and tottered about dragging her feet one behind the other. But she bore the pain stoically, and it never found any reflection in her swarthy, lean, and happy face. 
Only the sweat stood out on her temples when the pain was more intense, by which Ilinichna would guess at her suffering and tell her to go and lie down. One fine September day, Natalia, feeling her time near at hand, turned to go out into the street. Where are you off to, Ilinichna asked her. Into the meadow. I'll see the cows out. Groaning and holding her hands beneath her belly, she walked hurriedly out beyond the village, made her way into a wilderness of wild thorn, and lay down. Dusk was falling when she returned by sideways to the hut, carrying twins in her canvas apron. My dear, you little devil, what's all this, and where have you been? Ilinichna found her voice. I was ashamed, so I went out. I didn't like to, in front of father. I'm clean, mother, and I've washed them. Take them, Natalia replied, turning pale. Dunya ran for the midwife, and Darya busied herself, lining a trough. Ilinichna, laughing and weeping for joy, shouted at her, Darya, put that trough down. Are they kittens that you want to put them in a trough? Lord, there's two of them. Oh, Lord, one's a boy. Natalia, put them to bed. When Pantelyamon heard that his daughter-in-law had given birth to twins, he opened wide his arms with astonishment, then wept happily and combed his beard. He shouted irrationally at the approaching midwife. You're a liar, you old hag. He shook his fist in front of the old crone's nose. You're a liar. The Mielyakov line isn't died out yet. My daughter's got a Cossack and a girl. There's a daughter-in-law for you. Lord, my God, for such kindness, how can I repay her? Fruitful was that year. The cow gave birth to twins. The sheep had twins. The goats. Astonished at the circumstance, Pantelyamon reasoned to himself, This is a lucky year, and profitable, everything having twins. What a fruitful time for us. Oh, ho! Natalia kept her children at the breast for twelve months. She weaned them in the September, but she did not get really well again until late in the autumn. Her teeth gleamed milkily in her emaciated face, and her eyes, seeming unnaturally large because of her thinness, shone with a warm light. All her life was devoted to the children. She grew negligent of herself and spent all her spare time with them, washing them, binding them, mending for them, Frequently sitting on the bed with one leg hanging, she would lift them out of the cradle, and with a movement of her shoulders releasing her full, large, melon-yellow breasts, would feed them both at once. They've sucked enough at you already. You feed them too often, Ilinichna would remark, slapping the full little legs of her grandchildren. Feed them. Don't spare the milk. We don't want it for cream, Pantelyamon would intervene with jealous roughness. During these years, life declined to its ebb, like flood water in the dawn. The days were dreary and exhausting and passed unobtrusively in a continual activity, in work, in petty needs, in little joys and a great unsleeping anxiety for those who were at the war. Rare letters in envelopes covered with postmarks arrived from Piotr and Grigor. Grigor's last letter had fallen into someone else's hands, Half of it was carefully obliterated with violet ink, and an incomprehensible sign had been made in ink in the margin of the gray paper. Pyotr wrote more frequently than Grigor, and in his letters to Daria, he implored and adjured her to give up her goings-on. Evidently, rumors of his wife's unseemly life had reached his ears. With his letters, Grigor sent home money, his pay and allowances for his crosses, and indicated that he had tried to get leave, but had failed. The two brothers' roads ran in very different directions. Grigor was oppressed by the war, and the flush was sucked out of his face, leaving a yellow jaundice. He did not expect to live to see the end. But Piotr climbed swiftly and easily upward. He wormed his way into the good graces of his company commander, was awarded two crosses, in the autumn of 1916 was made a corporal, and he was now talking in his letters of attempting to get himself sent to an officer's school. During the summer, he sent home a German officer's helmet and cloak and his own photograph. His aging features stared complacently from the gray card, his twisted flaxen mustaches stuck upward, and under the snub nose, the well-known grin parted his lips. Life was smiling on Piotr, and the war delighted him because it opened up unusual prospects. But for its coming, 
How could he, a simple Cossack, ever have dreamed of an officer's commission and a different, sweeter life? Only in one respect did Pyotr's life have an unpleasant feature. Ugly rumors concerning his wife circulated in the village. Stepan Astakhov was given leave in the autumn of 1916, and on his return to the regiment boasted to all the company of his splendid time with Pyotr's wife. Pyotr would not believe the stories. His face went dark, but he smiled and said, Stepan's a liar. He's trying to get his own back for Grigor. But one day, as Stepan was coming out of his dugout, whether by accident or design, he dropped an embroidered lace handkerchief. Pyotr, who was just behind him, picked it up and at once recognized his wife's handiwork. Again, the old hostility broke out between them. Pyotr watched for his opportunity. Death watched over Stepan. If Pyotr could, he would have had Stepan lying on the bank of the Divina with Pyotr's mark on his skull. But ere long it happened that Stepan went out on an expedition to get rid of a German outpost and did not come back. The Cossacks who went with him said the German heard them cutting the barbed wire and flung a grenade. The Cossacks managed to get up to him and Stepan knocked him down with his fist, but a supporting guard opened fire and Stepan fell. The Cossacks bayoneted the second guard, dragged away the German stunned by Stepan's blow, and attempted to pick Stepan up also. But he was too heavy, and they had to leave him. Stepan pleaded, Brothers, don't let me go. Comrades, what are you leaving me for? But a hail of machine gun bullets spattered through the wire, and the Cossacks crawled away. Brothers, Stepan called after them. But what of that? Your own skin has to be saved before another's. When Pyotr heard of Stepan's fate, he felt relieved, like a sore on the bottom after anointing it with dripping. But he resolved, nonetheless, that when he got leave, he would have Daria's blood. He wasn't Stepan. He wouldn't stand for that. He thought of killing her, but at once rejected the idea. Kill the serpent and ruin all my life because of her? Rot in a prison? Lose all my labors? Lose everything? He decided merely to beat her, but in such a fashion that it would deprive her of all desire ever to raise her tail again. I'll knock her eyes out, the snake, he thought as he sat in the trenches not far from the steep, clayey bank of the Divina River. That autumn, Daria made up for all her hungry, husbandless life. One morning, Pantoliemon Prokofievich awoke as usual before the rest of the family and went out into the yard. He clutched his head, overcome by what he saw. The gates had been removed from their hinges and had been flung down in the middle of the road. It was an insult, a disgrace. The old man immediately put the gates back in their place, and after breakfast called Daria outside into the summer kitchen. What they talked about was never known to the others, but a few minutes later Dunya saw Daria run disheveled and crying out of the kitchen, her kerchief awry. As she passed Dunya, she swung her shoulders, and the black arches of her eyebrows quivered in her tear-stained, angry face. "'You wait, you old devil! I'll pay you out for this!' she hissed between her swollen lips. Dunya saw that her jacket was torn at the back, and a fresh, livid bruise showed on her bare shoulders. She ran up the steps and disappeared into the porch, while from the summer kitchen Pantoliemon came limping, as evil as the devil, and folding up some new leather reins as he walked." Dunya heard her father say, I'll teach you to play those games, you bitch, you whore. Order was restored in the hut. For some days, Daria went about quieter than water, lower than the grass, went to bed before anybody else each night and smiled coldly at Natalia's sympathetic glances, shrugging her shoulders and raising her eyebrows as though saying, All right, we shall see. On the fourth day after... An incident occurred of which only Daria and old Pantoliemon knew. Afterwards, Daria went about laughing triumphantly, but the old man was embarrassed for a whole week, and as disconcerted as a doctored cat. He did not tell his wife what had occurred, and even at confession kept the incident and his own sinful thoughts about it a secret from Father Visarion. What happened was this. Pantoliemon was not sure of Daria's complete conversion, and he told his wife, Ilinichna, Don't spare Daria. Make her work harder. She'll never go wrong at work, and she's a slippery hussy, 
All she thinks of is nights out. He himself made Daria clean out the threshing floor and gather up the wood chips in the backyard and helped her to clear the chaff shed. Later the same afternoon, he thought he would shift the winnowing machine from the barn into the chaff shed and called his daughter-in-law to help him. Adjusting her kerchief and shaking off the chaff which had worked beneath the collar of her jacket, Daria came out and passed through the threshing floor into the barn. Pantoliemon, in a padded woolen workaday coat and ragged trousers, went in front. The yard was empty. Dunya was helping her mother spin the autumn's wool, and Natalia was setting the dough for the morrow's bread. The evening sunset was glowing beyond the village. The bell was ringing for vespers. A little raspberry-colored cloud hung motionless in the zenith of the translucent sky. The rooks were hanging in black burning knobs on the bare branches of the gray poplars beyond the dawn. In the empty silence of the evening, sound was sharp and distinct. The heavy scent of steaming dung and hay came from the cattle yard. Pantoliemon and Daria carried the faded red winnowing machine into the chaff shed and set it down in a corner. He raked away some fallen chaff and turned to go out. Father... Daria called in a low whisper. He went back to the winnowing machine, asking, What's the matter? Here, Father, here's something. Come and look, she said, bending sideways and stealthily glancing across the old man's shoulder at the open door. He went right up to her. Suddenly she flung out her arms, and embracing his neck and interlocking her fingers, she stepped back, dragging him after her and whispering, Here, Father, here, it's softer. "'What's the matter with you?' Pantoliemon asked in alarm. Wringing his head from side to side, he tried to free himself of her arms, but she drew his head more strongly towards her own face, breathing hotly in his beard and laughing and whispering. "'Let me go, you bitch!' the old man struggled, feeling his daughter-in-law's straining belly right against him. Pressing still closer, she fell backward and drew him down on top of herself. "'The devil, she's gone silly. Damn you, let me go!' he spluttered. "'Don't you want to?' Daria panted. Opening her hands, she shoved the old man in the chest. "'Or perhaps you can't. Then don't judge me, do you hear?' Jumping to her feet, she hurriedly adjusted her skirt, brushed the chaff off her back, and shouted into the frenzied old man's face. "'What did you beat me for the other day? Am I an old woman? Weren't you the same when you were young? My husband?' I haven't seen him for a year. And what am I to do, lie with a dog? A fig for you, one leg. Here, take this. She made an indecent gesture, and her eyebrows working went towards the door. At the door she once more carefully examined her clothes, brushed the dust from her jacket and kerchief, and said without looking back at Pantoliemon, I can't do without it. I need a Cossack, and if you don't want to, I'll find one for myself and you keep your mouth shut. With a furtive, hurried gait, she went to the door of the threshing floor and disappeared without a glance back, while Pantoliemon remained standing by the winnowing machine, chewing his beard and staring guiltily and disconcertedly around the chaff shed. Perhaps she's right after all. Maybe I should have sinned with her, he thought in his perplexity, flabbergasted by what had happened to him. In November, the frost gripped icily. An early snow fell. At the bend by the upper end of the village, the dawn was frozen over. Occasionally someone ventured over the dove blue ice to the farther side. Lower down, only the edges of the river were sheeted with thin ice, and the stream ran turbulently in the middle, the green waves tossing their gray heads. In the pool below the black cliff, the sheet fish had long since sunk in a wintry somnolence to a depth of seventy feet. The carp lay nearby. Only the pike struggled upstream and shied at the dam in its chase after whitebait. The sterlet lay above the gravel. The fishermen waited for a strong frost in order to drag the river for fish. In November, the Mielyakovs received a letter from Gregor. He wrote from Romania, saying he had been wounded. A bullet had shattered the bone of his left arm, and so he was being sent back to his own district whilst the wound was healing. A further woe came upon the Mielyakov household, hard on the heels of the first. Eighteen months previously, Pantoliemon had had need of money, and had borrowed a hundred rubles from Sergei Mokhov, giving him a bill of sale as security. 
During the summer, the old man had been called into Mokhov's shop and had been asked whether he intended to pay or not. Pantelyemon's gaze had wandered distractedly around the half-empty shelves and the shining counters, and he had hesitated. Wait a bit. Give me time to turn round a little, and I'll pay it back, he had said at last. But the old man had not been able to turn around. The harvest had been poor, and the cattle were not worth selling. Suddenly, like snow in June, the bailiff arrived at the village administration office, sent for Pantelyemon, and demanded in so many words, Put down a hundred rubles. Pantelyemon asked permission to go home, promising to bring the money the very same day. But he made straight for Koshinov's hut. On the square he met armless Alexei Shamil. Still limping, Pantelyemon, Shamil greeted him. Little by little. Going far? To Korshinov on business. Oh? You'll find them merry. Their son Mitka has come back from the front, I hear. Is that so? So I've been told, Shamil replied, winking with his eye and cheek. Pulling out his pouch, he added, Have a smoke, old boy. My paper, your tobacco. Pantelyemon lit a cigarette and stood hesitating whether to go to see Korshinov or not. Finally, he decided to go and limped on. Mitka's got a cross, too. He's trying to catch up to your sons. We've got as many crosses in the village now as sparrows in the bushes, Shamil called after him. Pantelyemon walked slowly to the end of the village, glanced through the window of Korshinov's hut, and went to the wicket gate. He was met by Miran himself. The old man's freckled face was shining with joy. Heard about our luck? Korshinov asked linking his arm in Pantelyemon's. I've just been told about it by Alexei Shamil, but I've come on other business. Let it wait. Come into the house and meet the lad. We've been having a little drink in our joy. You needn't have told me, Pantelyemon smiled and dilated his nostrils. I've smelt it already. Miran flung open the door and stood aside to let Pantelyemon pass in. He stepped across the threshold and at once fixed his gaze on Mitka, who was sitting behind the table. Here he is, our soldier lad, Grandad Grishaka exclaimed with tears in his eyes, falling on Mitka's shoulder. Pantelyemon took Mitka's long hand in his and stepped back a pace, looking him over in astonishment. Well, what are you staring at? Mitka asked hoarsely with a smile on his face. I can't help looking. I'm so astonished. I saw you and Gregor off at the same time, and you were children. And now look at you, a Cossack, and fit for the Ottoman's regiment at that. Lukinichna gazed at Mitka with eyes filled with tears, at the same time attempting to pour out vodka into a glass. Not watching what she was doing, she let it spill over the edge. Hey, you scab, what are you doing wasting good spirit? Miran bawled at her. To your joy and to you, Mitka, on your happy homecoming, Pantelyemon said, passing his eyes round the room. Without taking breath, he sipped down the vodka, slowly wiping his lips and whiskers with his palm, he fixed his eyes on the bottom of the glass, threw his head back, tossed an orphaned drop of vodka into his gaping mouth, and only then took a breath and bit at a pickled cucumber, blinking beatifically. Lukinichna poured him out a second glass, and the old man at once got ludicrously fuddled. Mitka watched him with a smile. The lad had certainly changed beyond recognition during his years of absence. In this healthy, black-whiskered Cossack almost nothing remained of the fine, elegant Mitka who had gone off to do his service three years previously. He had grown considerably, his shoulders had broadened, he had filled out, and certainly weighed not less than thirteen stone. His face and voice were coarser, and he looked older than his years. Only the eyes were the same, just as disturbing and restless. Mitka lived a thoughtless, bird-like existence. Life today was good, and tomorrow would take care of itself. He was not too keen on soldiering, and despite his fearless heart, he did not go out of his way to earn distinction, although when he was mentioned in dispatches, it was just as well for him. He had been twice court-martialed, once for raping a Russian-born Polish woman, and once for stealing. During the three years of war, he had received innumerable punishments, and on one occasion the field court-martial had all but sentenced him to be shot. But he had managed somehow to extricate himself, and although he was one of the worst characters in the regiment, the Cossacks liked him for his gay, smiling morals and his bawdy songs, for his comradeship and straightforward nature.
whilst the officers liked him for his brigand ardor. Smilingly, Mitka trod the earth with light, wolfish feet. There was a good deal of the wolf breed in him. For Mitka, life was simple and direct, stretching away like a furrow, and he walked along it the absolute master. Just as primitively simple and direct were his thoughts. If you were hungry, you could and should steal even from your comrades, and Mitka stole when he was hungry. If your boots were worn out, it was the simplest thing in the world to take a pair from a German prisoner. If you were punished, you must make up somehow for your crime, and Mitka did make up for it, going out and bringing back half-strangled German outposts and volunteering for the most dangerous enterprises. In 1915, he had been wounded and taken prisoner, but the same night, tearing his fingernails to pieces, he had broken through the roof of the shed and fled, picking up some wagon harness for a keepsake as he went, and in such ways Mitka got away with a good deal. So you've won the cross, Pantoljemin said, smiling drunkenly. Who hasn't got a cross among the Cossacks, Mitka frowned. He's proud, old Grishaka hurried to intervene. He's just like me. He can't bow his back. They don't give them crosses for that, Pantoljemin was about to reply angrily. But Miran drew him into the kitchen, sat down on a chest, and asked him, How's Natalia and the grandchildren? All alive and well? Praise God. You said you'd come on business, didn't you? What is it? Speak up, or we'll be drinking again, and you'll be too drunk to talk. Give me money, for the love of God, to help me, or I'll be ruined by these... by this money matter, Pantoljemin implored with expansive, drunken abasement. Miran interrupted. How much? A hundred rubles. Korshinov rummaged in the chest, pulled out a greasy kerchief, untied it, and counted out ten ten-ruble notes. Thank you, Miran Grigorievich. You've saved us from misery, Pantoljemin said. No, don't thank me, when it's our own flesh and blood. Mitka spent five days at home. He passed his nights with Anikushka's wife, having pity on woman's bitter need, and even more on her, a helpless and simple grass widow. The days he spent wandering among his kinsfolk and friends. Dressed in a simple light overcoat, he swung down the streets with his cap pushed back on his head, vaunting his strength against the cold. One evening he looked in on the Melyakovs. He brought the scent of frost and the unforgettable pungent smell of the soldier with him into the overheated kitchen, sat talking about the war, the village news, then narrowed his green eyes at Daria and rose to go. Daria flickered like the flame of a candle when the door banged behind him, and pressing her lips together was about to put on her kerchief, but Ilinichna asked, Where are you off to, Daria? I want to go outside. I'll come with you. Pantoljemin sat without raising his head, as though he had not heard the question and reply. Daria went past him to the door, her eyelids drooping over the wolfish gleam in her eyes, her mother-in-law tottering heavily after her. Mitka was coughing and scrunching his feet at the gate. At the sound of the door latch, he turned to come back to the steps. That you, Mitka? You haven't lost your way in our yard, Ilinichna called spitefully. Fasten the gate behind you, or it will be banging all night in this wind. No, I'm not lost. I'll fasten the gate, Mitka replied in a tone of chagrin, and strode straight across the street toward Anikushka's yard. On the sixth day, Miran drove his son to the Milyarova station and stood watching as the line of green boxes rattled away. Then dug long at the platform with his whip, not raising his bleary eyes. Lukinichna wept for her son. Old Grishaka coughed and blew his nose into his hand, then wiped his palm on his coat. And Anikushka's grass widow wept as she recalled Mitka's great body, so feverish in caresses, and as she suffered with the clap she had caught from him. Time entangled the days as the wind a horse's mane. Just before Christmas a thaw unexpectedly set in, rain fell for days on end, the water raged down from the hills along the dry courses. The last year's grass showed green on the bared headlands. The edges of the dawn foamed, and the ice turned a cadaverous blue and swelled. An inexpressibly sweet scent was exuded by the bare black earth. The water bubbled in the wheel tracks of the high road. The clayey cliffs beyond the village yawned with fresh landslides and ruddy wounds. The southerly wind brought the heavy scent of rotten grass. 
And at noonday, dove blue, tender shadows lurked on the horizon as in spring. In the village, rippling pools stood on the top of the ashes, heaped up against the fences. The earth melted around the ricks in the threshing floors, and the cloying sweetness of damp straw pricked the noses of passers-by. In the daytime, a tarry water ran off the straw, icicle-hung roofs and down the cornices. The magpies chattered incessantly on the fences, and the village bull, wintering in Miran Korshinov's yard, bellowed, enraged by the premature languor of spring. He tore at the fence with his horns and kicked up the crumbling, watery snow. The dawn broke on the second day of Christmas. The ice floated off down the middle of the stream with a mighty grinding and groaning. Like sleepy, monstrous fish, the flows were driven onto the banks. Beyond the dawn, urged on by the agitating southern wind, the poplars fled in immobile, flexible flight. But towards nightfall, the hills began to roar. The ravens fluttered and squawked on the square. Christonia's pig ran past the Melyakov's yard with a bunch of hay in its jaws, and Pantoliemon decided that the spring was nipped off again. A frost would set in on the morrow. During the night, the wind veered round to the east, a light frost veneered the puddles with a crystal ice. By the morning, the wind was blowing from Moscow, and the frost had set hard again. Winter rained once more. Only fragments of flows floated down the middle of the dawn in great white sheets, and the bared earth smoked frostily on the rise. Shortly after Christmas, the village secretary informed Pantoliemon at a meeting that he had seen Grigor in Kamyanska, and that he had asked the official to inform his parents that he would soon be coming over to visit them.